Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, 4B. <laughs> we're not actually starting yet. We're still waiting for people to come, but I thought I'd just start chatting to you while we're waiting for the session to start. Um, I asked all my wonderful speakers to think about what it was they wanted to do when they were about seven. And they've thought about that, and I don't know what their answers are going to be yet. But um, I'm kind of curious. I, I did a test when I was in the Sundance session yesterday. Because I really remember what I wanted to do at seven, but I wondered if that was just me. And I said, do people have a, like, a strong memory? And everyone went, yeah, yeah. So it was kind of interesting. And uh, someone wanted to be a horse vet. Sh she's not. Um, guy wants to be an astrophysicist, and he's a, he's a violinist, which felt kind of, kind of, kind of great. Um, the best one was um, one woman said uh, she wanted to be a cartoon character when she was seven. And then the woman across from her in the in the circle, we were all sharing stories, said, oh, I wanted to be the first woman, uh, you know, secretary of the UN <laughs> <laughs> at seven. It's pretty divergent um, de desires. So um, I'm going to call out people I know. Cara Mertes, what did you want to do when you were seven? All right. All right, that's good. Who else do I know? Tabitha Jackson, what did you want to do when you were seven? To be nice, <laughs> still, a, still a work in progress then, yeah. <laughs> Who else? Uh, okay, I'm going to pick on people I don't know. What did you want to do when you were seven, sir? I wanted to be a professional baseball player, I think. <laughs> how, did, how did that work out for you? Not so good, because I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm the executive director of Apopo US. Uh, right. <laughs> well, but then we're very happy that the world of baseball didn't get you. What did you want to do, sir? Well, I also wanted to be a professional baseball player. Oh. <laughs> who who wanted to be a professional baseball player when they were seven? <laughs> okay, it's, I wonder if there's like a certain demographic in the room. What did you What did you want to be when you were seven? I wanted to be an astronaut. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but Richard, but Richard Branson, Richard Branson may still send you to space. And what are you, And what are you now? Uh, an artist. So that's kind of dreamy, dreamy. The dreamy, beautiful things. What did uh, what did you want to be when you were seven? Um, the president. <laughs> Even though I wasn't eligible. <laughs> the president of just anything, everything. everything. The pr just, pre just, just president. Where, in whatever room you walk into, president. Pre president, president. Very good. Let's take a couple more. What? Yes. Here we go. Someone who's got a someone's got a volunteer. Exactly. I'm not picking on people anymore. I wanted to be Cindy Brady, for those of you who watch the Brady Bunch. <laughs> I wanted to be her. <laughs> That's very cute. So, um, maybe we should, maybe we should um, I think we probably should start in a minute and get sensible. But um, before we get sensible, panel, to reveal the truth. Bart, what do you want to do when you were seven? Seven, I actually, well, I didn't know really what I wanted to be. Maybe I wanted to be like my dad and my mom, who were both teachers at that time. But uh, I've been thinking very hard about your question. And um, well, the farthest ambition, farthest back that I can actually go is, is when I was nine. I wanted to, to be a rodent breeder. And, and, I, did, <laughs> and I did that for some time. <laughs> But you put those two things together, the teacher <laughs> and the rodent breeder. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. It, wor it worked out quite well for you. Yeah. <laughs> Frederick, what was, your, what was your ambition at seven? Uh, when I was growing up and at seven years old, I really wanted to be a doctor. And I was really fascinated by the fact that someone could fall sick and there was someone who was going to turn that around and they would become well again and um, just regain their health and, and be strong and then continue doing what, 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 they're, what they're doing. But I'm not a doctor now. Except, I mean, what session was it yesterday? Someone was saying you know, to be a health worker is to be, you know, oh, to be a partner worker. in health. Is, what, was, what session was that from? Um, the speech. The spe was it the speech from the, in the plenary? Yeah. Yeah. Saying anyone who gets involved in the health. Yes, of course, the, that fantastic awardee um, from, from, from last yeah. night. Yes. Yeah. Saying anyone who gets involved in the health of the community. You know, you're, so, you, in fact, you are a. You've made, I think you've made good. Yeah, I mean, in quite an interesting way, because n nowadays now I treat attitudes. I treat uh, yeah. people who look at others differently and, in a way that they, they put them down. So I still, I'm a doctor. 
Let's keep going. Let's hear Marina. Oh, I'm pretty sure at seven I wanted to be a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> big loss for the world of ballet. Yeah, and a big say. loss for the world of ballet. <laughs> I'm yeah. still aspiring. <laughs> and Gabriella? Uh, well, when I was seven, I fell in love with reading, and one of my favorite authors was Ronald Dahl. So I read a book called Henry Sugar, it's the wonderful story of Henry Sugar. Yeah. And he became magical, had magic powers by staring into the black part of a flame. So I wanted to be magic. And I actually did practice staring into the black part of a flame for hours on end. Can, you do, can you do card tricks? No. <laughs> it was larger magic. Mm. Is my mic uh, loud enough? It feels like it's not to me, but maybe the... It's good? You're saying up? No, you're saying... It's good. Yeah, just up a little smidge, please. Be great. I think the speakers are facing your way, so it's hard for me to judge. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share my own. I really, really, really want to be a long-distance lorry driver. Because <laughs> I love the idea of being all on my own and, and travelling and not having yeah. anyone to, Huge. you know, being independent. And, and I thought as well it would mean my dog could come to work with me, <laughs> which was very important uh, criteria. Well, anyway, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I guess we've sort of slid into introducing the panel. Um, in fact, hell, before we get completely serious, I bought them each a toy. Oh, wow. Um, because of this thing about childhood dreams and where you've ended up. So I've, I've hidden them behind here. Oh. oh. You won't be surprised <laughs> about, who, <laughs> about who, who this guy is for. <laughs> it's very, very cute. He's really cute. So, Bart, there's a... Can it's I hold a, it? Yeah, here's for you. It's a, right. it's, it's, but you have to yank it off my hand. Right. It's a gift for you. Wow. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and I have, uh, I have a little city in a bag Ooh. for, for yeah. the lady who works with... This is London city in a bag. So inside are all the little landmarks of London. So you, wow. can, you can... After she's reconfigured Mexico, she can reconfigure London at home. <laughs> and... Uh, I have, uh, for, for the people who think of the future, I've got the, the curl from Back to the Future, Yay. which is Thank really you. cool. Wow. And then for Frederick, I've bought him a loud hailer so that he can continue to amplify the voices of others. <laughs> oh, okay, we should get sensible now and do this panel. Okay. <laughs> Um, so thanks all for coming. Um, the, obviously the big theme uh, uh, this year is about ambition. And I very much liked Stephen Chambers' opening quote where he quoted Edmund Burke and said, ambition can creep uh, as well as soar. So I wanted to put forward another, another quote uh, to kick us off. This one from another Irishman, an, uh, an Oxford alumni, uh, Oscar Wilde. Because it struck me that there's someone who, had he been born in more recent times, would have had uh, a much happier life. As probably uh, many in the room, but maybe not all know, uh, as well as producing some absolutely amazing and witty works of literature, he was also sent to prison for his homosexuality and died very young at 46. But he graduated from Magdalen with a double first and a reputation as an incredible new young poet. And had he been born in more modern times, he might even have been uh, here, you know, with us, um, either as a social commentator or perhaps invited by Sally to, um, to read some poems for us. So I wanted to bring forward this quote, because I felt like if he was here, he would probably be blogging on the importance of being ambitious, because uh, this quote from him says, Our ambition should be to rule ourselves, the true kingdom for each one of us, and true progress is to know more and be more, and to do more. Yeah. And that really leads me to my amazing panel, who indeed are knowing more, being more, and doing more. And I think this panel very much will model the experience that we're all having here at Skull, which is that you find yourself in conversation with four people clustered together, all of whom are doing completely diverse things, all of whom completely fascinating. And by the end of it, you've become firm friends, and you can't wait to see each other uh, here again next year. So the format we're going to do um, is is each one of them is going to speak for eight minutes. Marina's going to speak about uh, awe and magic and inspiration. Gabriella, about cities, creativity and power. Bart is going to speak about rats and minds and hopefully <laughs> Buddhism. 
Possibly. He might slip some Buddhism in at the end there. Okay. And Frederick is going to speak to us about youth and disability and ability. So they're each going to have their eight minutes, and then I'm actually not going to involve you, the audience. That was your bit. Unless I really, I'm really feeling that you really want to come in, because actually what I thought would be really nice to do is after each one has spoken, that the other three will then ask a question and, and a remark and kind of follow up. So you'll see basically three kind of quick questions and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And that means that we should actually be finished here in shorter than the full time. And then what I would really like is there to be a good 10 or 15 minutes at the end where we're not kicked out of the room for the next session. And that means that you can all come and meet one or all of the speakers and talk with them yourselves. How does that sound? Yeah. Okay, great. But if you get frustrated and you think, this is rubbish, we should have asked for questions, then, you know, let me know, give me that feedback, and we can throw um, a mic out there. Um, on that note, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, this session is being filmed. I'm not sure. So, you know, don't go crazy. Don't take your clothes off, run around, you know. Um, and phones, of course, um, you're very welcome to keep your phones on. We'd very much like you to, to tweet, and I think everyone probably by now knows the hashtag that you need which is uh, SCOLWF, it's probably on the, on the screen there. But if you can make sure that your f uh, phones are set to silent, um, just so that it doesn't interrupt things, although we forgive you if it happens, because it, it always happens, doesn't it? There's always one. Sometimes that one's been me. It's not a good feeling. But anyway, if you can try and avoid it, that would be very much appreciated. And so, with no um, further ado, we're going to kick off and we're going to have Marina. Please give her just such a big, warm and welcoming round of applause. so much, by the way. It's the first time on a panel where a moderator brings gifts, so <laughs> it's wonderful. So um, about a year ago, um, during something called the Day of Civic Hacking, National Day of Civic Hacking, believe it or not, there is such a day in the U.S., and one is coming up in May, a group of social inventors came together and decided that what they wanted to do is create a space, a physical space for social innovation, to experiment, to do crazy things, to come up with creative ideas and to do it for a, a period of time. So they came across an abandoned building in a mid-market area of San Francisco. For those of you who know that area, it's not a particularly great area. It's kind of a Bermuda Triangle of drugs, criminality, <laughs> prostitution, and other kinds of things. It's right next door to St. Vincent's uh, soup kitchen, so a lot of homeless people all around. But they managed to get it from somebody for a dollar for a month. So it was a deal they couldn't pass up. So they got this building and they called it free space. And they put it in brackets, meaning that it's open to whatever happens in that space. It's open to experimentation. It's open to developing in whatever way people want to develop it. And they went to social media, they went to Facebook and all the media, um, traditional social media stuff, and they told people what they need. They said, we got the space and we can make it anything we want. So we need everything. We need chairs, we need tables, we need Wi-Fi, we need drugs, we need your energy to come, we need to, somebody to come and clean up the space. So amazingly enough, literally within the period of three or four days, this space, this building, 24,000 square feet, this space was transformed. Artists started, came in and they painted beautiful murals inside and outside. They cleaned up the space, they bring, brought chairs, they did all this, they created an urban garden. And one of the things uh, when I was visiting there, there was a family from the neighborhood. It, it was open to everybody. So the family from the neighborhood came in. It was a nine-month-old child. And that was the first time that that child actually touched grass. So that was just an amazing feeling to have. They created principles, self-governance principles, among things like uh, nobody is a spectator here. Everybody is a contributor. Once you're part of this space, you have to bring yourself into the space. No ego, no logo. And that's the only thing you needed to read as you went into the space. So the space was open, and a lot of people from St. Vincent Kitchen and the neighborhood became part of these communities. They were serving as reception. They were doing other things. They were, became part of this amazing community. 
people started doing classes like yoga classes and coding and programming, all kinds of dance classes and other things. Uh, they started various kinds of projects, including this bike sharing project. The interesting thing about this particular project is at the same time the city was trying to roll out a bike sharing program and it ended up costing them about $10,000 per bike. And these guys managed to do it for $38 a bike. So a bit of difference there. There was somebody who started a learning shelter. Mark Roth was a homeless person who spent his last $50 going to tech shop where he took a bunch of classes on manufacturing and linked up with other people, started his own company. So he went into free space to basically create this learning shelter for other homeless people. And there were dozens of other amazing projects that came out from free space. So basically this is how this building was transformed within just one month, right? And that, to me, is just an incredible experience. Now there's a year later, not quite a year later, there are free spaces popping up all over the world. There's free space in Mexico City. I think there is one happening in Burma to, um, just around now. There's one in Paris and Berlin. And the idea has kind of caught on. It took less than a year to, to catch on. And this, there are several sort of remarkable things about this particular undertaking. To me, it's an example of what I call social structuring, which is basically our ability to synchronize action, to do pretty amazing things. With, and the other things that's really amazing, another way to think about it, is what are we capable of doing without management, without money, without staff? How is it possible that these people just came together without anybody giving them directions on what to do and how to do it and paying them money and they accomplished just an amazing thing and the projects that spun out of it, there, as I said, there are dozens of these projects. And to me, it's about achieving a kind of synchronicity. So synchronicity is something that we do effortlessly, that we are able to coordinate our activity without much effort. And these kinds of undertakings are really about this kind of synchronicity. And today we have amazing technologies for helping us achieve that kind of synchronicity. We have all kinds of tools and social media, as you know, that we can bring people together. But to me, they are not the most important part Technology is an enabler of this. It allows us to scale up participation. It allows us to achieve synchronicity on a much larger scale. But really, the main driver, I think, of synchronicity is something very, very familiar. It's our, our emotions. It's our adaptive emotions. It's those things we feel when we're confronted with an amazing idea, an amazing uh, purpose, and we can rise up to it. A lot of yesterday in the audience when um, the Skoll Awards were taking place. So I think every one of those people is like, they evoke this sense of awe and, and magic about it. And you want to help them, you want to support, you want to participate in their idea, in what they're doing. It's something that we do when we're seeing something and want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Um, there are Stanford researchers who studied this feeling of awe and found that when we're in the state of awe, the time, our perception of time changes. We feel like time is much more expansive, like there's a vastness to it. So we're capable of achieving much greater things than when we're not in the state of awe. And when we combine these very old tools for synchronicity, like our emotions, the sense of awe the, and sense of magic, the sense of inspiration with these new tools, we can scale up this synchronicity to the levels that we don't even know today. We're just kind of at the beginning of this journey. Uh, I think the, the band yesterday was an example of that, playing for change, where they brought all these artists from all over the world. The, one of my favorite examples of that, you probably are familiar, was Eric Whitaker's virtual choir, where he asked people from different countries, I think 100, over 100 different countries, people were contributing videos of themselves singing parts in his composition. And then he stitched it together into one virtual choir. And this is, um, you've probably seen this, but this is the result of that. These people are doing it in their homes, in their offices, wherever they are, and it produces this remarkable feeling connectedness with the rest of the world, this feeling of 
it's about singing together, but it's really about sort of synchronizing in completely new ways. So, when um, one of the things that I would love to see is that when we think about the possibilities, we can synchronize on these completely new levels and, and new ways. And so, um, what do we synchronize around? What do we? What tools do we? Use? What, how do we do this? And I think for us to think about this, we really need to abandon some of the traditional vocabulary of economic development, of growth, and all of that. And this is coming from a recovering economist, so you're safe. I've been thinking about this a lot, that this is something, we need to include new words and new levers into how we think about building thriving communities and thriving world. And things like inspiration and awe and all of these terms that are really taboo to probably most generations of economists and urban planners, I think that this is part of our kind of post-development agenda, post-economic agenda, is to change our vocabulary and develop this new vocabulary and think about new levers for how we can build these thriving communities. Wonderful, please give a big round of applause. I like the way you you know, took an example of these new models of collaboration from the really from the local and then sort of to the global. And I love the idea of putting the magic back into economics. Well, that's really fantastic. Questions from your co-speakers or comments, in fact. Bart. Yeah, I'm I'm awed by <laughs> <laughs> by by actually what you already said earlier and and and, and this as well. I'm wondering this uh, the space in San Francisco, uh, the free space. <coughs> Um, what is their model of, how do they, uh, like what is the model of, of replication actually? The model is really, they're not going in and opening free spaces, mm -hmm. they're taking what's already there and creating a network of very similar kind of spaces and each one is creating the, its own governance systems but the idea is the same, that it's about participation, it's about creating this kind of, I think it's, you know, when we think about development and when we think about urban development, traditional model is you give grants and, you know, there is a donor and there is a receiver and it's all kind of flowing from one place to another. I think this is an alternative model where you just create something really awesome right there in the neighborhood and you just open doors mm -hmm. and they become magnets so people don't feel like they are supplicants. They're part of this community. They're just part of it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think that's a model that they're replicating in other places. And each one has a different um, sort of slant in a way that's local. So one may be more about making and the other one is more about fashion and the third mm -hmm. one is a, more about something else. Mm -hmm. Gabriella, you have a question? Sure. Uh, I know you're in futures thinking mm -hmm. and that you, so you're looking for signals about the world to come. Do you think this is still very much a marginal thing of these people coming up and looking to co-create the reality of their city? Or is this something that you see is, is acquiring critical mass? And what do we need for this to become even larger and have these changes of vocabularies that you mentioned? I, I'm really impressed with how quickly the idea has grown and how it's propagated. So it's, prob it's resonating, obviously, in a lot of communities with, an, with a lot of people. So yeah, it may be marginal, but you know, that's what futures look for. They look at these signals on the margins and then become a much bigger thing. And there's something I think that they tap into in all of us. Like, we want to be doing that, right? Like, it's hard not to participate in something that's so awesome. You want to be part of this community. You want to be part of that. So I think they're, they are tapping in this other, in all these other levers than traditional sort of development and doesn't, tap into. Mm. And Frederick, I have a question for you. Do you see this working in your context? You live in, you live in Nairobi? <laughs> um, there might be uh, several ways of looking at it. In, in some other ways, it, sh it, it should, because there's, there's a way that we need to design I mean, our cities. There's a way we need to look at how are people living together and be able to see, is this space going to fit us, and how do we need to prepare for the future um, generation for, so for them to fit and feel 
um, accommodated within a particular space. So futuristically, if you're thinking about that space, then you're able to see, to be able to plan in, well in advance and see if it's about the population, if it's about how it's going to look like and you're able to refocus. Because so much of your work is thinking about how to make those spaces work really yeah. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think on that note, in fact, you're going to be next. Are you, how are you feeling about being next? <laughs> <laughs> you, you wanted to go second, but maybe now you're thinking that was such a bad idea, I should have, no, I should have picked third. <laughs> are you ready? Yes, yeah. Please, everyone, give Frederick. So he's come all the way from... In fact, actually, you know what? I'm going to be his big sister right now and say, can everyone shut their laptops just for Frederick's eight minutes, please? Because he's come all the way from Nairobi to speak with us. And as his, as his big sister, uh, yeah, I want everyone to have their, have their eyes on him. Great. Please give him a big round of applause. <laughs> no. No um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can we all imagine a world where we are living, dancing, singing, struggling together? Probably not all of us will imagine that particular world, but this is like the ideal world that everybody wants. And when they're born in this world, this is the world that they want. And so when I was born several years ago, I won't tell you <laughs> how many of those years were, but at the age of two, a story is told that I was attacked by a mysterious disease. And nobody in our village knew what this disease was. And it, it was really disturbing that I had to travel several miles for, to try and look for a doctor. And perhaps this is, the, this is why I wanted to be a doctor, to be able to diagnose the kind of sickness that I was, uh, had attacked me, the kind of illness that had gotten into my body system. But nobody really managed to, I mean, arrest that particular eventuality. And so my father and mother one day told me that at age of two, I got polio, and so it seemed that was it. But growing up, being different, has been one of the most interesting things to ever happen to my life, because I went to a special school at the age of around six, so I could not see my mother and dad for three months, you can imagine kid of six years, seven years, not seeing their mother and father for that long time. But when I went to school, the beauty of going to that school, the teachers told me that actually you can become somebody in this same society. So when we always closed school going home, I could see kids running around asking me what had happened to me. Because then I was walking using um, assistive devices, a walking aid, a caliper, or crutch, just as I came on this stage. And it was clear to me in my life, when I walk, I'll have to dance. So I knew I was not going to make any apology for that. But here, when I go home, people are fascinated that why is it that I'm dancing always, even if there's no music? <laughs> so. But coming back to school, I was really excited, working hard in class, because the teacher will always encourage me that, you know what, this, this is the education that will give you a future. It's the education that's going to give you your job. And I performed very well in class. And went to high school, graduated very well, and went to uh, college. Interestingly, I was interested in business. And so I got my diploma in business management, and I wanted to go to work. So a big corporation had announced for, um, advertised for a job. I put in an application. And so when I was waiting in the waiting area for this interview, I could see my colleagues who had gone in because I sent in my CV and I was shortlisted. Everybody was being given around plus and minus 15 minutes. But coming to this interesting interview, when it reached my time, everybody was looking at me what did you come to do here? Are you Fred? Okay, so tell us what you can offer. And I said everything, the way you will prepare for a normal interview. But I never saw or had the chance to be interviewed for more than two minutes. 
And that was it. So I was asking myself, what was wrong? Is it that I was super prepared for this particular interview? <laughs> I mean, that was my fate. And coming out, I knew I wasn't going to get that job. And those are the experience of millions of young people with disabilities in Kenya. And I said, if this is the narrative of this particular society, I will be interested in rewriting this particular narrative. We cannot accept a society that looks down upon people who they think are differently abled. People who they already predetermine that you are not able to do one or two things. And I said, after all, they're not going to give me a job. So I have to find a job for myself, but also I have to be able to assist millions of other young people who are within the same country that doesn't accept that they came to the planet Earth. By the way, in Kenya, we have over five million persons with disability. So this number is huge for someone just to sit back and, and, and do nothing about it and say, oh, perhaps it was only myself who, I mean, had a, um, a bad luck that day. Given that it was the attitude of the employer not to see that I need to hear this person and see what kind of competence he has for me to be able to evaluate and see if they can get this job or not, that means the right way to do that is to come back to that, this particular employer and begin a conversation, not make any noise, begin a conversation with this particular employer and be able to explain to him or her that, by the way, do you know what? It's not that wheelchair. It's not that blindness that actually works. It is somebody's capabilities that you need to be looking at, not the way they came. They can come while crying. They can come while dancing as I did. But it is what am I offering this particular um, uh, opportunity at, at the workspace. So this is actually the beginning of the work that I dedicated my life to as a passion. Action Network for the Disabled was born. And the fact that we have to explain to people that diversity is actually a beauty in itself, that we should all celebrate diversity is important. All the time and every day, I meet young people who are graduated, who have special skills. What they need is just an opportunity at the workspace to be able to express that in exchange of an income, as everybody else. I mean, everybody loves an income. Everybody feels independent if they are able to spend using what they so hard worked for. So I spend my time training young people in entrepreneurship. I spend my time training employers in how do you facilitate someone to come at your space to give a skill, to give a competence for, in return for them to get an income. I'm not asking for charity. The conversation is around how do we make this environment adaptable? How do we allow someone on a wheelchair to come through to this office and work as this, at the same level as their peers and be able to go home feeling that they actually contributed to the building of this particular nation for which they were born in and they never applied for. So my experience over the years is that when someone gets a chance, as I did to go to school, they actually want to see how does that theory translate to practice. And if society is saying you can go to school, yes, but for working, no. There's a big disconnect. And now everybody is talking big about ending poverty. So then I was wondering, how do we end this poverty if those that within society we say are the poorest of the poor can't access jobs, 
They can't start a business because if they go to a bank, ah, perhaps this is someone who's just from the street who's supposed to be begging. Yet, I have my business plan. I want capital to start a business, but nobody's listening to me. And we found it important and actually fulfilling that we are able to train young people to start small-scale businesses. We are able to advance them capital, and those, that capital has helped them actually launch their small-scale businesses, and they're succeeding. We've also found out that actually the employer didn't really want to discriminate, but they had no information about how to work with this person when they come to jo the job they're dancing. And that has enabled them to now have confidence that, oh, okay, actually, what I need to ensure that Fred has is an accessible um, maybe ramp to the office, and he is able to work just as anybody else and get his income. And that has really brought a whole paradigm shift within the workspace that everybody feels we never knew that actually diversity is beautiful and diversity is business. When we embrace diversity at the workspace, when we give that person an opportunity to work, to provide a skill in return of income, that's what everybody wants. And that's how we're going to end poverty in this world. But not about charity, but allowing people to offer their skill, supporting them to start their own small-scale businesses, and not looking to the fact that they're differently able, but looking at what are the skills that they're providing. And this the dream and the ambition that I have through Action Network for the Disabled to ensure as much as possible that nobody gets discriminated on the grounds of the disability. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was indeed beautiful. Bart, do you have a question yeah, for your and, and neighbor? For, first, an expression, actually. The, I mean, for it, people like you, to me, are my source of inspiration. Um, people who manage to transform suffering into empowerment of, of others. Is, I think this goes really deep. Um, so thank you for sharing that story. And I have a question for you. Uh, so what's next for the Action Network for the Disabled? I mean, obviously, you guys need things to, to increase your impact. How much do you need and what do you need it for? <laughs> Thank you, good question. <laughs> um, really, we, we are about how do we support persons with disability to establish their business? And it's been, there's been a challenge about where do we get the resources to advance to these young people, even if they're coming in their thousands to our offices. Sometimes you are limited in setting them up. So um, getting resources to put in a fund that then they can apply, and we have staff who are helping them work through their business plans, do the market research, and so when, when they get this money, and, and actually sometimes we advance just maybe someone needs $150, someone needs $250, someone needs maybe just $300 to begin, and this helps them to come to a level whereby now they have enough confidence to go and apply for another bank loan now to continue their work. So it's around just resources to arrange this and also getting more companies working with us for these particular uh, individuals to get work experience when they're interning or being directly employed. So do I understand well, you need actually to set up a fund to help invest in these single proprietary businesses? Yes, yes. Okay. Good. And people who have um, networks of uh, businesses in, uh, in Kenya, or just in Kenya or beyond Kenya? For now, Kenya. Now it's only in Kenya. Okay, so people who have any of those networks too should um, come and introduce themselves to, to Fred at the end of the session. Do you have networks? Are you offering them? Can I just share that we have a sister on the border of Ukraine who turned in three years with a handicapped daycare center for little children, $10,000 investment, $650,000 revenue in three years. And it's given hope for 60 children and trying to scale this in Europe. So if you're interested to talk after, I can connect you with her. And um, it's absolutely the way to go, what you're doing. In my country, uh, I think this woman is probably the best entrepreneur in the country because when I ask her, do you take a salary? She says, no, I'm an entrepreneur. I should take last. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. 
Champs, you got a question? I also just an amazing inspirational story, so thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering, how do you, or do you do both? Do you work with employers to educate them, but how much of it is also legislative agenda changing laws and regulations around? Yeah, so, so work with both, and, and because um, in, in our country, um, a legislation can just be a piece of legislation on paper, and we actually do have quotas for employment of persons with disability, but it's incredibly difficult to get it implemented. So um, they're expecting me as a, as, as a citizen to prove that actually a person with disability can work, and where do, I, where do I get to prove? So I have to show that we have successful business of people with disability being run by persons with disability, I mean, in, in, in relation with, with their family members or something like that, but also I have to show employers that Frederick can work, and, and it has taken me to um, a situation where sometimes I have to pay for someone to work and tell the company not to pay them so that they can just see that this person can work, and then after three months, I'll ask them, why is it that you can't employ them? And they'll like, they will feel ashamed, like, okay, yeah, we're going to take him in. So really, it's, it's, it's two both. So both providing an evidence that it, it works, and it's only that you fear, and then we take it from you. So people need to see that it actually works. And, and also the government, when they see that it's working, and you say what we need to see now is this particular legislation being implemented, then they can begin to listen to you because you already uh, created an authority around you that you, you have practiced, that you've done, that people can look at. Gabriela, you have a question? Uh, I'm wondering about the skill building and the training that the, the, the people that that you work with. Is there is this, this personalized and everybody gets, a, a, let's say, a program designed for the, their own case? Or is this uh, programs that uh, several people go through? Or how does that work? So the training is actually personalized because there's no way I'm going to put a deaf colleague for training with someone who's blind or someone who's, 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 an, who's a physical disability. So for the deaf, it has to, they have to have translation, they have to, and that, it means it will, it will take longer. And at the back of your mind, you have to understand. But you see, in Kenya, we have an system, educational system that expects everyone to climb a tree as a way of an exam. Tell me how a person in a wheelchair is going to climb a tree. And that's the mark of how you're saying, when you climb this tree, that's how we're going to consider you as successful. So relooking that and saying, excuse me, it's not, it's not that everybody can climb a tree. Why can't we say that there's things that we can do down here and say, okay, so there was a tree and try to create an impression of, of that tree yeah. down. So really customizing and seeing this person has these particular challenges and how do we adapt to those challenges because everyone wants to succeed and it's not only about academics. If we are able to tap into your talent and it is your talent that would make you have an income, well, so be it. So we even encouraging people who can sing, people who can dance, people who can draw to do that. And we are going, we are supporting them so that they see that as a way of income, but not just leisure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how many people do you work with in uh, the space for, of a year, more or less? Yeah, for, for now we're working for around, with, with around 500 people. Yeah. And, and actually this, this number is 500, but we're locking out others because we can't just do mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you so much. You. Yeah, give me another round of applause, go on. And, and Gabriella, do you want to stand at the podium? Do you want to stay in your seat? What do you want to do? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll stand. Now, she declared herself to be the most nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so that means you have to give her the most encouragement exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> Go, Gabriella. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I feel ready now. Um, <laughs> So I came to tell you about a story that happened very recently of how somebody that has dedicated her whole life to defending independent space, uh, coming from an arts background, from filmmaking, journalism, et cetera, et cetera, suddenly found herself working as a government bureaucrat. So I am a government virgin, and for the last, a little bit less than a year, I have been running uh, Laboratorio para la Ciudad, which is laboratory for the city. And this is the creative think tank slash experimental space for the Mexico City government. Um, I had the fortune of having our now mayor call me up when he was running for office and basically offer me completely f complete freedom to think of what would I do with a, a new type of city department. Um, so these experimental spaces are every time more common. There's more or less about 14 worldwide, which is very interesting. 
Uh, most of them are in first world countries, smaller cities in Mexico City. And the interesting thing is that though we all share this common purpose of giving government a space where it can experiment and try out new things, we all have a completely different slant as well to our activities. So why is experimentation important for government? Uh, there is kind of like an oxy a paradox there where we expect government to be solid and reliable for obviously good reasons. But at the same time, many times we complain that they're not agile enough and not innovative en uh, enough. So this is where we come in. We can mitigate risk and we can bring in all sorts of unusual suspects, if you will, to, to think about what government and city could look like. So um, we have an interesting challenge. We're a very small lab in one very big city. I don't know how many of you have been in Mexico City, but it's 22 million people in a metropolitan area. And it's definitely not a city for the faint-hearted. So we have, um, the Mexico City was built upon a lake almost 700 years ago. So it's also the oldest, not only the largest, but also the oldest city on the American continent. Uh, we're surrounded by a chain of mountains, 42 active volcanoes, and the city center sits upon a lake. 50% uh, of our population is under 26 years old. 50% of our uh, econom uh, economic development comes from the informal economy. 60% uh, of our city started informally. So it's really interesting to work in this context and see what a lab can do. We've decided on two main axes. One of them is civic innovation, which basically means how can we start reinventing and reimagining the way that government comes together with civil society to think about city and to think about government. The other one is urban creativity, uh, which has to do with thinking the city itself as this free space, if you will, like the commons and the, the potential that it holds for all of us once it gets articulated into into its different parts and, and you can use the different pot potentialities, if you will, of the, of the different people and talents that it contains. So uh, as a new government office, I find it very poetic that we ended up in the, in, at the, in the rooftop of a government building. This is the, our office. It's a, a thousand square meter green rooftop that overlooks the city center. Uh, this is my team. It, it's a young team composed of a, a motley crew what can I say? It's uh, the only one that had prior experience in government is the guy in glasses, which is our lawyer. I thought a lawyer was important for him to have experience in this. The rest of us are artists and filmmakers and sociologists and psychologists and architects and historians. Uh, so it's, it's been very interesting stepping into this new space. And I've always said that in regards to civic innovation, we are actually the first experiment of the laboratory. Like we are a group of people that come from civil society most of my directors had actually a lot of experience building community around important subjects such as health and uh, community engagement and this and that, and working very closely with our mayor who was beautifully crazy enough to actually let us all in into, into government. This is our, our building from outside. This is our, uh, our rooftop and this is our working space. So what we're trying to do is have this working space become a, a physical metaphor of what we're trying to do of opening up government. So what we're doing in the space is creating events all the time. We have workshops and we have um, debates and we have conferences and we have forums and workshops and talks. Um, and we've been lucky enough to have really good attendance and it's really interesting to see how much interest there is from on behalf of civil society to be able to join up with government and try to co-create solutions for the city. Um, one of the interesting things that we have is the opposite challenge to the rest of the government that usually needs elbow room because of very tight mandates. We actually have a lot of freedom and we can get ourselves into any type of subject, basically always trying to push the limits and to be provocative. So we decided, thinking that language is, as Marina said, a very important thing, that we would work within provocations to be able to design our constraints. So provocation number 001, open government, government as platform, number 002, walkable megalopolis, number 003, urban imaginaries, and so on. So all of these provocations have all, uh, pilot projects, urban interventions, conversations, and other type of, of uh, policy making, other type of activities designed into themselves, and they're very much a live system, and we take decisions and bring people in and, and decide on, on the projects we do, depending on the challenge at hand. Um, so this is our webpage, and here you can take a look at some of the experiments that we've been doing in the last six months. One of the things that we think Mexico City has the potential to be is this hub of international ideas, because as you probably know, Mexico City has every challenge that an emerging city has, social divide, urban sprawl, uh, 
obesity problems, you name it, we have it. But we're also the eighth largest economy in the world and it's also a very sophisticated city with a lot of talent in, in, in its folds. Um, so one of the examples that we've been working on very quickly, uh, so you can see the serious stuff first, is the open government program. So if we're into civic innovation, we saw we needed to take a step back and start opening up other spaces of the, of the government for the citizens and not only ours. So we've been working um, on not only on tra uh, taking transparency and accountability to its next levels that have to do with participation, collaboration, as well as innovation, and opening up data sets with uh, uh, 13 different ministries, and working with a really interesting group of people that had not necessarily been talking within government. Uh, Mexico City government is 100,000 people strong, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of silos and conversations that aren't had. So this is where we come in as a strategic area. Um, and so we've been creating all sorts of encounters and, and really trying to, to change culture within, bringing together the IT departments for the first time, um, and basically finding spaces for sharing and for best practices. And we also involve civil society. So the first one, our first conference of open government, was full to the brim with 500 people in the second day that we launched the the, the call, so there is, it's very beautiful to see, as I mentioned, that there's huge hunger to be able to collaborate. This is a hackathon that we did recently, and on the second day we already had 500 people that were willing to give 48 hours of their life to work with mentors from within government and come up with digital solutions with the data sets that the, that the ministries were also working with. Um, to follow this, we also started a laboratory of data, Laboratorio de Datos, which is piloting what interoperability between departments uh, means. Like, how can we start sharing data within government as well as sharing it with civil society? Because as people have said many times, the most intelligent person is not actually in the room. So how can this data uh, become a public resource so people can, can help the city come up with, with amazing solutions? Um, we also rolled out Code for Mexico City and we have six civic hackers working with six civic departments, basically marrying the, the know-how and intelligence of within the different ministries with new methodologies and new skills that a younger generation has. Um, we are also creating digital participatory platforms, very much in, in tune with what Marina was talking about, as well as a, a lot more uh, ambitious projects that can be proposed to the laboratory and that we help get together the people and the resources that are needed for this. We have, uh, we're starting an editorial project as well to talk about all these experiences. And we have a uh, residency as well. So we've had two residents in the last six months. This is Perry Chen, our last one, who as you probably know is a co-founder of Kickstarter, uh, who, who has put the world on its head in terms of crowdsourcing for creative projects and now pulls in a million three hundred dollars a day for creative projects. So this is the type of things and the type of ideas that we want there to, to be contagious in Mexico City. Nicola Twiley doing a residency in the largest wholesale market in the world, which is five million people come into this market uh, every day. So instead of doing a residency at, an, at a museum, we now get to offer the city. Um, so basically, what is this about? You know, during modernist times, during the 70s, many of the, our, our idea of the city was about practicality. How do you get quickly from A to B? How do we make efficient cities? But this has been changing drastically. And what we're proposing is that cities nowadays should also be not only for the human body, but also for the human imagination. Like, how can a city catalyze all of these, uh, all of these images? And this is, this is one of our questions. Like, government as catalyzer, as creative agent, can this happen? Can we stop being bureaucrats and actually become uh, the people that further uh, citizens and basically have citizens think of themselves as this, as, um, as a creative agent within the, the city folds. Um, so basically, this, is, this idea also comes from uh, an idea from the 70s of Henri, Henri Lefebvre that talked a lot about the right to the city and to access the city. And we want to take it a step further and make it the right to co-create the reality of a city. Um, and basically, as I mentioned, think of government officers as city creators as well. And I have too many slides still left, and Je Jesse just signaled that I, so I will stop there, but I'd be very happy to share other experiences that we've had in, in these past six months with anybody that's interested. Thank, Thank you. you. Wow. <laughs> I, I wanted to pinch myself and think, can it be true? This is amazing. And how do we um, 
get other governments to see this kind of forward thinking. It's fantastic. Um, Marina, you're already familiar with this project, yeah, so you can you can attest that it's indeed true. And Mexico City is an amazing place, and it's it's amazing to see this happen. I. I'm wondering, do you feel like you are at the kind of bleeding edge of this? Who else is doing this kind of, like, who do you look to as your peers and people who are doing interesting things in the space of open government and kind of redefining the city? It's, that, that I think has been one of our interesting challenges because we, as a new space and as people that just stepped into government, we, we really need to be pushed and squeezed into, into honing our talents and, and really having our, our, our projects create social value and create value for, for government as well. Um, but the thing is, sometimes you get squeezed in the wrong direction. Like I, I have the feeling that many times when you, when you get into a structure that, is, that has like this whole history and sometimes a lethargic history as government, uh, many times there is a force that unwillingly tries to make you so symbiotic with the thing that contains you that you become exactly the same. And so there's no differentiation and we, we would lose our power. So it's been very interesting seeing, first of all, that we've had more government buy-in than I, I thought. Hmm. But at the same time that we need people um, to really be critical about what we're doing, uh, so we, we challenge ourselves continuously. And those people have been both my, my, the people that are doing similar labs. Again, we're not necessarily identical to each other. A lot. I'm the only one that comes from the art world. Um, so some of our projects are actually quite outlandish, not only practical in nature, but really trying to rethink what a political voice could sound like. And what are these urban forms that we've been repeating ad nauseum that we could rethink and reinvent to get the city itself to, to have a voice? So I think men, most of those um, gauntlets that get thrown at us come from the arts world, from sociologists, from, from other urban planners that are thinking that government does have a potential to create big changes. Um, at the beginning, somebody was telling me, you know, why should government be creative? Why should it be innovative? But it has too much of an impact in the city for us not to demand that it become this as well. Um, Great, thank you. Frederick, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, how, how easy is it to, I mean, ha have government to work with civil society? And, and, and in my part of the world, I know that is really kind of protagonist, I mean, really bringing these two together, how, how do you manage it? Uh, it's, that has been one of our most fascinating exercises. My, one of my next slide actually talked about one of our missions is marrying um, political will with social energy. So there's, there's very interesting people within government. I must say it's been a very humbling experience to step into the other side because I basically thought government, I must confess, was devoid of life, not even, <laughs> not even talent. And I'm finding amazing people there and also coming to realize that many of the changes that Mexico City has gone through in the last years actually ha started with public policy. So right now we're opening up space in crazy ways. We, we pass gay rights before cities like New York. We have euthanasia and abortion laws and all sorts of things. Um, the, basically the city, the city people were the ones that created the grid that then the social energy filled up and made relevant uh, for, for a much larger population. So there's, there's really interesting hunger on both sides, I think to start redefining what responsibility means in a city as complicated and as fascinating as Mexico City and that we can't do it alone. No? So we have the possibility of thinking of a 22 million people city as 22 million mouths to feed, which is one paradigm. And on the other hand, we also have uh, the possibility of thinking of 22 million minds. Um, just recent, yesterday there was a protest in Mexico City because they surreptitiously wanted to pass a law about um, about being able to cut off internet communication if it was good for the public, well, it was, yeah, for the public good and national security. And there was a very big protest, a lot of young people, and one of the things that they did was throw little paper airplanes at the Senate with ideas. So, you know, I, I, I find this like an amazing change of paradigm, which is not only demands, but it's actually young people that are throwing ideas at the government. So I, I have a feeling that there's something that is, that is emerging there and bubbling to the surface uh, with every time we're forced. Wonderful. What a wonderful image. I'm now thinking that would be a good panel format for <laughs> next year. <laughs> but. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Um, the, the, and, and fantastic that, of course, it's always people in the governments that make the change, of course. But 
uh, the environments that Fred and I mostly operate in are, are the, the governments are, well, I wouldn't say disablers, but uh, still they're definitely not enablers. And I'm wondering what actually, what incentives are there for, uh, for people in those institutions that, that we work in uh, to, to enter into a game like, like you're doing with, with the Mexican government? That is a great question because one of the things that we think that building this culture of innovation within government and without government has to do with designing the proper incentives. Um, we've, it's been very interesting, again, like truly humbling, stepping on the other side. I now see that many times when we demand transparency and accountability to government with a stick in our hands, it actually creates um, somewhat of a perverse system that we are all accountable for in, in many ways of creating like these lethargic governments that try to block out their citizens. Um, there's all the horrible stuff you hear about, but there's also some really fascinating people and ideas. And I think, uh, for, fortunately, Mexico City has prized, I think, these government officials that have gone a little bit beyond what they were expected to do. So, for example, the lady that, that uh, was in charge of the bike sharing system for Mexico City, at the beginning, everybody told her, both civil society and government said, you're crazy, like, this is a death wish, this is a megalopolis, this is... Um, this is not going to happen in the city. We're not Copenhagen. Uh, three years later, we proved that we're not Copenhagen. We are Mexico City, and it's even better in many ways because it's, it's, there's 20,000 bike rides a day. And this has changed not only transportation, but it's also changed our idea of the city. So I think once that comes into play, like once you can link up like these things that are nascent and these great ideas that are being born in other cities as well, because I, I'm also fascinated by how the contagiousness of ideas from city to city. Um, we have our, my mayor won with a 64% landslide, and Mexico City has, uh, has only had a mayor since 97, and always left-wing government, and doing green transportation, as I mentioned, opening public space. And they have been prized for it with votes. So I think once you get the virtuous circle going, it becomes every time easier. And one of my big surprises was that we actually have a lot of ministries coming to us and saying, we want to work with you, what can we do? Instead of us having to force them to, to, to work with us. So the, so the interest is there. Cool. Not with everybody, but yeah. we have enough people um, on the side of curiosity to not necessarily have to deal right now with the... And I like that word, which I think I first hear, heard here at Skoll, of the intrapreneur, mm -hmm. which the entrepreneur needs to find, which is the, the insider inside a large structure who's actually open to connecting to the, to, to the outside creativity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that was absolutely wonderful. And now it's time for Bart. For the, for the rats, actually. It's time for the rats. <laughs> now, Frederick, can you see the... Do you have a good... Can you see the TV okay? Is the podium in your way? The podium is not in your way. Yes. Okay, perfect, good. Fred, um, I just was worried that you couldn't see it, but if you're sure that you can see, because I don't want you to miss Bart's film. <laughs> should, um, well, you have the floor, Bart. Please give him a big round of applause. Yeah, so, so actually the, I was asked to talk about ambition and, and really it took, me, it took me the whole week actually <laughs> to get my head around the team. Um, and, and I still didn't know yesterday night. Um, but there were a few wise men I was having a drink with, and, and, and they told me, you know, ambition in itself is neutral, which is very true. So it has to be fed and, and nourished by values, which is very true. And um, so thinking of, from these uh, and, and sharing my, well, my experience with, with this wonderful organization, whether it is now Apopo, uh, where I had the luck to start this, through my love for rodents and, and my concern for uh, the dependency of, of uh, vulnerable communities at the bottom of the pyramid who are affected by, by this landmine problem. Um, uh, yeah, brought me into a storyline that I think I can share with you. So I, I grew up in a, in a very um, caring family and uh, learned at an early age to the skills of empathy and um, as I grew up, and, uh, and I think most of you know this story of, of, of me breeding rats and selling them to pet shops for pocket money. Um, I, I quit that when I was 14. Uh, but then I, I studied product design with a, a focus on appropriate technologies for developing countries. And as my three older brothers left the house, uh, for various reasons, one got married, one migrated to Canada, and another uh, actually went for studies in Leuven. Um, 
So the house was empty. I, I, le I was left alone, and my parents opened a house to African students who came to study in Antwerp. So my three older Mzungu brothers were replaced by three older African kakas. And uh, so for me, that was the most learnful experience. Um, I actually learned about a totally different way of thinking where um, our Western mode of basic mode of philosophic mode is, is a Cartesian one where the reason for existence is the fact that I can think, which in itself is an ego strengthening thing. Um, I learned about Ubuntu and a totally different reason for existence because of the collective. My reason for existence is, is because we as and I say now as a global community, because we exist together. And it gives a totally different perspective on, on how to interact with the world and, and with its natural resources. I think the difference between my approach uh, in the quest for an appropriate landmine detector and what most engineering departments did in, in that time um, was indeed the fact that I placed myself in the situation of subsistence farmers and looked at what resources they had at hand. And really, there isn't so much in these villages uh, where people are dependent on in expensive imported know-how and, and technologies. Um, but there's lots of natural resources, um, rats. And um, well, contrary to what most of you think, rats can, when they are cared about, uh, be wonderful pets. Uh, they can, um, they're very sociable, uh, easy to train. Um, if, and, and well, Training them to detect landmines and, and training them to, to screen for tuberculosis are, of course, uh, um, noble things to do, but um, we try to, to actually take away the root causes of, of these problems by empowering these youth, um, men and women alike. Uh, it, it's, it's really about creating job opportunities and, and building skills in these people. Um, they go and from Tanzania, where we have our headquarters, they go and work in countries like Mozambique or Angola, and, uh, and they work there as experts in animal training. It's so wonderful to see, first of all, that they can interact with these animals and these animals save lives. And then in the same time, that uh, through learning these skills, these people get out of poverty. Uh, they come back after missions of three months, six months in, in mine affected countries, and uh, yeah, and they go to the bank, they can get a loan now and build a house, send their kids to school, uh, have access to public health services, uh, which are often uh, dilapidating, but uh, well, with the help of the hero rats, we actually do some work on that as well. Um, and, and just to give you some numbers, it's something I'm, I'm actually really proud of is, is that our team is, is uh, has been able actually this year, just a few months from now, the whole of Mozambique is going to be declared landmine free. And, um, <laughs> and of, course, of course, credits go to, to many organizations uh, that have over the years uh, uh, been active in, in mine action, but Apopo is, is now the, the biggest operator in the country and uh, two provinces, uh, Maputo and Gaza province, uh, we have been responsible for. Um, we actually find all kinds of, uh, well, based on the values of Apopo, being uh, quality, innovation, diversity, of course, and uh, social transformation. Um, we constantly renew and try to innovate uh, all kinds of uh, lucrative ways to uh, help this humanitarian uh, work forward. And one of the, of the novelties uh, within developed by our team is uh, well, you know about this Hero Rat adoption program, uh, already existing a few years, but this is now being automated uh, with a, a CRM database connected to it. So people can online actually pull their credit card and adopt a rat, and, and then they get uh, stories of these rats. Um, so, so they can choose an avatar and, and a name for their rat. And, um, um, we try to, to bring in all kinds of gamification aspects in, into the adoption program. So people now can actually get a badge uh, for every stage of training the animal goes through, and the badge can be shared on their Twitter or on, the, on their Facebook, better said. Um, and so we actually hope this goes viral and people will start wanting to compete. 
which rats of whom has made more impact. Um, because as this, you can choose then whether you choose a landmine detection rat or, or a TB detection rat. And uh, yeah, as these animals work and find their first mines, you actually do get impact badges. Um, so many mines found, uh, so many square meters cleared. Yeah. And really this is what it's all about. It's, it's about creating the necessary conditions for development for the most vulnerable on the planet. And you, you were telling us some of the names that people uh, give their rats. Yeah, we have all kinds of, of names. We have, an, uh, we have a Michelle and an Obama. Um, <laughs> all famous soccer players have their equivalent in rats. Um, uh, Princess Astrid of Belgium, who is our honorary president, uh, has a, an equivalent n named rat. Um, there's, yeah, you, you, uh, any name. Uh, yeah. Any name will Any, any name, name is possible. Will, any, any name will do. And it's actually also a nice present uh, we experience for, for Valentine's Day, for instance, people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. And it, it, the nice thing also is it's accessible, and that was the purpose, to make this uh, a platform so that we can involve the large public with this goal, which is a highly specialized activity. Mine action, TB detection is, is, is very technical. And, and so to, to involve uh, a broad public with this, and it goes from young to old, actually. It, it only costs the price of a coffee per month minimum. Uh, so actually kids can adopt a rat, it's within the reach and we think there is a great educational component in that as well. But also we have uh, one rat that was adopted for $20,000, um, so it, it also happens. You can all open your laptops now, that's <laughs> absolutely fine. <laughs> no, take, a, take a look at it when you're home. And, uh, but yeah. It's not a, not a purpose to, to be a fundraiser here, but, but I just <laughs> want to actually uh, I want to demonstrate it, that innovation if, if, if uh, well, done in an inspired way, it can actually have a huge Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, worried you're running a fundraiser. I think no one wants to miss out. Um, <laughs> Frederick, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, um, I've known Bud for some time now, and I'm wondering how, he talked about diversity, how does he put that in perspective of his work, which, which is really highly mm. specialized. Uh -huh. Yeah, diversity in, in in many ways, um, myself, I'm a, I'm a Zen Buddhist priest, uh, and I, I created this uh, secular organization, on purpose secular, uh, to make it universal. So we work with Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, agnostics, atheists, uh, animists, and there's place for everybody there. And, and we feel that this common space, which is uh, it's, it's a non-dogmatic common space where um, a better world is, is, is created, there really needs to be place for diversity. Um, we also employ, uh, we try to look for gender balance. Uh, it's not common that women are the minors, um, but we, we try to, and, and they prove to actually perform better than the men, actually. Um, they're more concentrated in their work. Um, we also um, employ uh, mine affected uh, people, people with injuries and, and uh, and uh, not so much because it's not so evident, uh, but uh, like for instance our radio operator in, in Mozambique is, is uh, somebody who survived uh, an anti-tank uh, blast that killed 11 people. There were 12 on, a, on a, an attractor with a trailer and they drove over and he was the only survivor, was still a young boy, lost both his legs. Um, so the, that kind of diversity we, we try to bring in. Yeah. Great, thank you. Gabriela, you have a question? Uh, yes, I'm, I was actually remembering when I saw your presentation that one of the things that I wanted to be when I was, I'm not sure seven, but when I was younger was an animal trainer. <laughs> so I'm curious right. about your first rat that you trained. What, what could it do besides, like, how did this evolution come about <laughs> to yeah. sniffing mines and, um, uh, and, and detection? Well, if Jess had asked what was your ambition when you were nine, I could have perfectly <laughs> responded to that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, she asked when it was seven, and that confused me. But <laughs> when I was nine, actually, I, I received a hamster uh, mm -hmm. for my birthday, and um, and I was very fond of that animal. 
I carried it around everywhere. Its favorite spot was here, and my armpit, it's like to crawl <laughs> in, in my, my shirt. Uh, and <laughs> one day uh, at school, it, I took it to school, and one day at school it was discovered, and so I had to leave it home. So I didn't like that too much, and I asked my parents uh, if I could have a playmate for it, and they agreed. Um, and they made babies, and <laughs> and, and so th that's how, uh, yeah, that's how I actually discovered that bringing those small rats to the shop, I get pocket money, and, and so that's how the all entrepreneurial thing started, um, based on greed, actually. Ambitious. And Marina, I'm just curious. Obviously, is there something special about rats, or can you take other sort of things that people, you know, are abundant but not necessarily mm. pleasant. Um, and <laughs> is, is there something about rats that's unique or can you potentially take other, I don't know, snakes, other mm. things? <laughs> well, the, the, the biodiversity, and, um, I mean, we, we ex explore only and we know so little about, like, um, there's, like in, in our back garden in Morogoro in Tanzania, there's hundreds of tree species that have never been documented yet. So, huh. for instance, and, and, and uh, yeah, amphibies and, and lots of an animals that have, have not yet uh, taxo taxonomically been, been identified. Um, so there's a huge resource, which is indeed, and so many people here, like the, the Amazon uh, protection uh, groups active here are, are, are working on that. To get to your question, Actually, quite some animals can sniff much better than human beings can. Um, why we use rats is because they are so logistically convenient. Uh, they are so easy to train. They love to perform these repetitive tasks in, food, in return for a simple food reward. You've all seen uh, like these hamsters in a, in a cage uh, running around. Um, for, for, for those uh, like Kara who think it's cruel to, to actually uh, uh, lock up animals in a cage, but I know that's not her concern, but, but some people have concerns about how, like, oh, you lock up these animals in a cage, well, what this kind of way is that? Well, you, you know, these animals are, are very happy. Uh, in the wild, they live for only two, three years. So with us, they live up to eight years. Some animals are older, oh. so animals older than 10 years even, um, and they, Actually, uh, after the training, they, they follow their trainers back to the cage, they jump in the cage, and, and it's a way of, they have good food and good medical care, and so they're really considered uh, as, as very, as pets, yeah. and they all have a name, uh, which make them individuals. Um, but the real strength is that they, they have an extreme keen sense of smell, and they, they have more genetic material mm -hmm. allocated to olfaction than any other mammal species. Fascinating. And Bart, I, I like that you began um, by reminding us that ambition can, is in itself neutral. It can end up being a sort of force for good or, or a force not for good. And it's important that we attach the right values to that ambition. And I also wanted, uh, there was a, a quote that I was almost used at the beginning, but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to use it now. Susan Sontag said, ambition, if it feeds at all, feeds on the ambition of others. And really, I think that's what the School World Forum is dedicated to. And I'm so proud to have been the moderator, to have shared with you the ambitions of these extraordinary people. Please give them all a huge round of applause. <laughs> we... Um, I think we don't have to be out of the room for another 10 minutes. I think that's correct. That is correct. Um, so if people would like to come up and meet these extraordinary people, please do so.